it seemed uh, fairly natural sort of thing to do. It was so close. You can actually see the apartment. It didn't feel that different to dining out the back garden. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. It's been a long time coming, about two months since the last episode were reviewed in terms of the Netflix documentary. I think we got up to the seventh and penultimate episode. In this episode we're dealing with the eighth and final episode in the Netflix series The Disappearance of Madeleine McCann and we'll be dividing the, the, the review of it and the analysis of it into three separate episodes. If you'd like to get the text version you can read the three blog posts that are up on Crime Rocket. I'll put a link to those reviews in the description to this particular episode and the episodes coming. So you can drill down into the details, look at the photos and look at the analysis uh, on those blog posts. Before we get to this episode and the analysis and review of the beginning of episode 8, the final episode in the series, before we get to that I want to address two things. The one is what Jerry says in the beginning of the clip that I've just played and then also what what does it imply what does this whole Netflix documentary series imply what does the timing about it imply what is the message behind the production what is the point of the production now I think a clue to the answers to that question and those questions is in that clip where you hear Jerry talking about why they were having dinner and and, th and that's a clip from the first episode in the series and he's basically just saying um, you know it was very natural what they were doing and there's kind of a almost a chuckle in his voice right and what that answer is actually saying is it's justifying the actions so this was a situation where, irrespective of whether the McCanns are um, responsible in a legal sense or in an ethical sense or in any sense, irrespective of whether they are responsible somewhat um, directly or indirectly, or whether there's some paedophile abducted that opportunistically used that uh, moment when they weren't at home with their three children, where both parents were not at home. So irrespective of which scenario you think is true, um, you would imagine that any parent in that situation would regret that they didn't, that, that they did what they did. You would, you would expect that they would um, be, there would be a, almost grief and sadness and um, regret around the fact that because of what they did, it ultimately led to them never seeing their child ever again. And, and almost a sense of, well, if only we hadn't done that, if only maybe we should have done something else. You know, maybe if we didn't do something, um, there would have been a better uh, end result. And instead of that, he justifies himself, but not in a sad way or in a, even in an angry way. He does it in a kind of a chuckling uh, chuckling way which to me sounds like arrogance it sounds like well of course you would do that and it just seems very strange because you would think you know this is the parent of the child surely he feels bad about it but it's certainly not coming across in this clip is it and when he says it didn't feel that different he's, he's sort of laughing right he's sort of in a light-hearted way saying you know it really wasn't a big deal and the the interesting thing is they just don't seem to get it they don't seem to get it that um, because of that just that um, 
you you kind of have a situation where this problem probably wouldn't have happened if they were all dining together just that and what is interesting is to I, I don't want to say everybody else but to a lot of other people there's a really big deal it was a very big deal to especially people in other countries um, Americans and uh, people in Portugal and and France and other countries they, they wouldn't do that as a matter of course and it is something that I think Detective Amaral said where he said um, it does seem peculiar to British people certainly some British people I guess this whole idea of you go on holiday and you dine apart now I know when I was a kid and we went on holiday we, we also sometimes dined apart but the kids would dine together so it, it was that kind of separateness not that you would be in, in the hotel room and your parents would go out and dine right so this sort of levity and this kind of light-heartedness is just for me very inappropriate I don't know what you think but the fact that this is being repeated in the documentary I think says a lot and although the McCanns have been explicit that they've got nothing to do with it that they apparently don't support it um, one's got to wonder where the fact that his voice is actually being quoted how did that happen and if Jerry's not happy with that if the McCann's aren't happy with the images and voice and the story being told in a certain way then, then why didn't they oppose it I mean they they went after uh, the D detective Amaral because they didn't like what he said they took him to court so, so wh why um, why if they didn't support the disappearance of Madeleine McCann, the making of it, why wouldn't they do the same? Isn't it because they actually support it? Isn't it because the Netflix series actually supports the McCann version of events? Isn't it because it makes the McCanns look good? Isn't it because it excuses the McCanns? Isn't it because it, it uh, endorses the McCanns version of events? And I don't think there's a, a, I don't think there's a big mystery surrounding the, those those kind of rhetorical questions I think it's hard to answer I think the other aspect to answer I think the more interesting question to answer is so if that is the case what were they doing was it simply a PR exercise and if it was for what towards what directed to what to whom why why then and that is something we're going to address through the course of the next three episodes uh, just a reminder, following the review of the end of the Netflix series, I'm going to be taking you through my trip to Pride Deluge at this time last year. I'm going to sh be showing you some photos and some video and some footage and some calculations and some theories that I've sort of put together. And uh, obviously at the time that I went there, I wrote the book Deep Into Darkness, so you can... If you're interested in the True Crime Rocket Science take on the McCann's, you can go and have a look at that. Now, in terms of episode 8, when I did my analysis on uh, the crime rocket, I titled the post, Rebellions are built on hope or on false hope. And I, and I did it as a play on Star Wars, the one episode, I think it was Rogue One where repeatedly there's this sort of um, affirmation you know rebellions are built on hope or something like that and um, I'm not sure if people have appreciated what what that is actually alluding to the McCann PR initiative if you want to call it that the, the, the McCann case is as far as I'm concerned like a rebellion it is it is there's a, there's a certain amount of data and information Right. In other words, there's the one narrative that Madeline has died, right? And then there's another narrative where she's still alive. And that, as far as I'm concerned, is a kind of a rebellious counter narrative, which is saying with no, with no facts or, or with no, no, nothing to support it. What I mean is there's no evidence that Madeline is alive. And that is the big argument that the McCanns make as a counter argument is that there's no proof that she's dead right so just in that respect I'm saying it's a rebellion it's a rebellious narrative it's a, it's a narrative that's 
Um, and, you know, I think an obvious way to address it is to say, okay, so if there's no evidence um, that Madeline is dead um, uh, and there's no evidence that Madeline's alive, do they sort of cancel each other out? And I think how one sort of rationally and logically, without any knowledge about on this case, uh, negotiates the argument is to say, well, if... Madeline is still alive, but you, there's no, there's n there's nothing heard from her for one year. Then, then, um, then it, it's probably a little less likely that she's alive. If you don't hear from her for two years at all, n no clues, no evidence, no ransom notes, nothing, no, no um, sightings or anything like that, then the chance diminishes that she's okay and that she's out there three four five six seven eight nine ten years without any news of madeline and the more time goes by the more it is likely that she's not out there and you could say well maybe she is out there and so what about 20 years how about 30 but you've got to come to a point where eventually you say well maybe after 50 years it's not unlikely that she's alive okay how about 80 years. I mean, maybe she's died of old age. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? And in other words, the longer the time goes on where you don't hear from her, the more likely it is that she simply doesn't exist anymore. Right? It just stands to reason. It's logical. I don't think one needs to take it that far to say, well, you know, you need that length of time. Um, but uh, in terms of the final episode, the, the series kicks off by boomeranging back, back to Robert Murat, who was the first suspect the series itself latched on, um, fixed in its crosshairs. But in the final episode, Murat is no longer sketched as a prime candidate for the paedophile or trafficker moniker. Now it's poor Robert Murat. So what, what's quite interesting with the mindfuckery of the series is it sort of starts off saying who could have done this and then it makes this case for robert murat right and it does what a, a lot of cynical true crime documentaries do you see it with quite a few um documentary apologies for example um uh in the john benet ramsey case in the chris watts case you see them set up the happy family fairy tale and then they pull it down. You see them set up a, what they present as a false narrative. So for example, they'll present it as that the Ramses must have been guilty of whatever happened to John Bonet. They set it up and then they pull it down and they say, no, well, this is actually what happened. And then it's meant to look like it's really not biased. It's, it's really, and you kind of get the same thing here. So with Robert Murat, he is presented as the credible, um, uh, alternative to the um, McCann's and you know he was in the inner circle and he had um, a funny look in his eye and and um, this and that and the next thing and so Robert Murat uh, and then they say oh no it couldn't have been Robert Murat and now you come all the way back to Robert Murat and what's fascinating is he's now retrofitted he's kind of re-engineered as the sort of poster boy for how horrible the media can be to a person. And it's true. How the media treated Robert Murat wasn't very fair. But I don't think the way Robert Murat was treated and the way the McCanns treated, were treated can be put on the same um, level. I don't think you can compare the two. Um, I think the McCanns were legitimate suspects. Um, they were the last to see Madeline alive. So, someone like Letitia Stork in this in the Gannon Stork case, the Mac the Ramses, anyone who's the last to see someone alive, should legitimately have a good explanation for what happened to the person, or where were they? What happened after they left that person? Can they account for all of their movements? And invariably, they can't. If they could, the case would go away immediately. And this is uh, something that is very often misunderstood with these high-profile cases is 
you get people who will petition for the people who involved, whether it's West Memphis 3 or Amanda Knox or Stephen Avery or um, or this case. And, and, and they'll say, um, you know, I don't understand uh, why these people are even, you know, it's definitely not them. But, well, then you say, okay, um, it should be quite simple. Do they have an alibi? Where were they when these events were supposed to have happened? And that is the problem. If they had an alibi, if it was very, very clear, if there was absolutely unambiguously a scenario where there's an, there's a, they are off the hook, then they wouldn't be under investigation. There, there wouldn't be, uh, let alone something going on unsolved, supposedly for years and years. So anyway, Robert Murat is retrofitted here. Now he's now he's used to introduce the the true villain of the um, of the of the story, and it's the media. The true villain here is the um, the media who have an agenda and they're out to get the McCanns. And if you think about it, the the media were kind of at the McCann's beck and call for the weeks and months following the incident. I mean, they were just basically doing press uh, briefings, almost like President Trump was with the, with the coronavirus, um, just doing press briefings, but, but just with no, um, taking no questions. And so you had this, this huge crowd of press at the McCann's beck and call, if the McCann said, we'll talk to you then, then the press would pitch up. And this led to them making a shitload of money. I mean, they made a lot of money because the press put their story front and center. And this obviously affected the hearts um, of ordinary people who were, who were the recipients of this coverage, who then donated money to the search for Madeleine. So, I don't know how one can say th the media were just the bad guys. But what's interesting is the guy who is telling one of the presenters of the story from The Sun, he suddenly reveals his true colors. Yeah, we basically says, I don't agree with how the media treated them. And so, so at the end of the series, you see that... Um, the people that have been selected to participate are almost all McCann apologists. Um, in fact, it's an army of McCann apologists from the spokespersons, spokespeople. Um, almost all of the spokespeople that ever worked for the McCanns are are there, right? And you, you you're not going to see virtually any authors or journalists who were really critical of them, um, as in in an up-to-date thing, giving their uh, responses. It's done in a third-person thing where they may refer to a newspaper article or something like that. But the voice of the thing is done in a way that, that amounts to apologia. So by the time we get to episode eight, the series seems to have covered a kind of full circle. Murat's no longer portrayed as a suspect, but as a victim. Same with the, the um, McCanns, and aren't they just like him? That, that's the comparison that's being made. Murat wasn't involved, and he was a victim. Isn't that the same with the McCanns? They weren't involved, aren't they victims too? It's a brilliant mindfuck for what's to follow, because this sympathetic twist is also an analogy, as I say, for the McCanns themselves. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink, as wholly innocent victims. The docu-series strikes a much more sympathetic tone as it winds down now, basically taking the view that one of the major villains of the story, besides Amaral, is the media. See, the media have condemned and falsely judged Murat, and coincidentally the McCanns as, as well. See, the media have perpetrated a terrible injustice on an innocent man, just as they have on a wonderful, loving, innocent couple, really. When the opening credits roll, Jim Gamble, and we really need to talk about him at some point too, because he's another arch apologist for the McCanns, but he does a handy voiceover about hope. He says, 
it's about hope. And hope is the fuel that keeps people going. And another way of saying that is the, the McCann PR narrative is about hope. And the McCann PR narrative is about hope, which is the fuel that keeps their fill in the missing space going. So if Jim is aware of it or not, whether he's participating w with inside knowledge or just out of blind luck or just by coincidence, he's saying exactly what the McCanns have been saying, that we will never give up hope, that the stuff that's on their social media all the time. And that's why I say rebellions are built on hope. Think about President Trump as well. When he's been speaking about opening up businesses, he's also trying to sell the rebellion of hope, which is now is not a good time in the middle of this pandemic. And I realize this is controversial, but now is not a good time in the middle of the peak of infections and so on. Certainly not, we're not at the end or the bottom of the slope, but we're sort of in the middle of it. Now is not the time to say things are great, let's go back to normal, and it's about hope. Um, I have hope that our economy is going to come roaring back. That is the narrative that uh, Trump sells, and it's the narrative people want to hear. People want to hear it. But that doesn't mean it's true. I want to address the aspect of hope that is such a crucial element of the McCann mythos and the key dynamic driving their PR narrative. Essentially, it is a narrative of hope. In the past, I've cited the idea that Rebellions are built on hope, but I suspect, I, I suspect it's fallen on deaf ears. It sounds nice. It sounds catchy. But what does it mean? It really requires explication. I'll do that at the end of this post, so put that thought in, in the back pocket for now. We'll attend to it later. The main theme of episode 8 is explicitly built around the notion of hope. And incidentally, it's the subtext to the entire series. So... While it is part of the subtext of the whole series, it only becomes really, it comes to the fore. It becomes explicit in the final episode. And that's also kind of a clever way of, um, of bringing about some mind fuckery through the series. It pretends to be neutral, investigative, uh, em emergentivistic, as opposed to reductionist. But it is reductionist. Whether Madeline was abducted by paedophiles, an orphanage, a traveling salesman, a gypsy, a gang of thieves, or Santa Claus, don't love that that was seriously presented as one of the infinite suspects in the Ramsey case. Any and every abduction scenario is a scenario that Madeline is still alive. And thus, this is just a missing persons case. In other words, there is still hope. As soon as the other narrative is acknowledged, then it's not merely that Madeline is dead, but almost automatic that her parents and perhaps others are involved in some more or less nefarious plot. Are they? Could they be? Or is there some other explanation? Did Madeline fall into a construction site? Curiously, it's the contention of Detective Amaral that Madeline may have accidentally fallen to her death for example, falling on the floor behind the blue sofa inside apartment 5A. So the fallen notion isn't absurd. It happens to children all the time. But consider how contrary the atavistic fallen notion is to the more progressive and thus sophisticated hope plot. And so for as long as the abduction narrative is popular and acceptable, and while the narrative that there's no evidence that Madeline is dead continues to hold, the parents and others will remain above suspicion and implicitly beyond reproach. That's not rocket, ro rocket science, we know this. Episode 8 is titled Somebody Knows, which is to say A. Somebody out there knows what happened to Madeline, who is alive, and B. That somebody is not Kate or Jerry McCann or any of the top of seven. Is not Goncalo Amaral either, but some anonymous other person. And then there's C. If Madeline herself is alive, apparently she doesn't know who she is either. Even though we're in the social media age where, you know, you can quickly find whatever you need to know and find connections to people you... you, you, you um, 
if you wish to make connections to people, it's it's easy to do that. So it seems very unlikely that Madeline wouldn't know that she's Madeline. If there's no evidence that Madeline is dead, does that mean she's alive? If no one has seen her for 13 years, does that mean she's alive? What about 20 years? At what point does the passage of time actually enter the equation besides the other crime scene related data? After 50 years, how about 60? And how, how are these time scales related to other missing person cases? What does the law say about this? Do we normally consider someone alive when they disappear for 30, 40, 50 years? If the law decides on this aspect, and it does, what sort of legal narrative are we actually talking about uh, then? Um, if we say there's no evidence to say she's dead, is there any evidence to say she's alive? I mean, there is evidence, and the evidence is the lack of evidence that she's alive, right? So what is quite interesting in the Kristen Smart case that is a case where a young woman has disappeared for 24 years. She's being investigated as a, um, it's a missing persons case, but they're looking for her DNA, which is to say they seem to suspect that she was murdered. And she's already been declared dead. She's been missing 24 years, twice as long as Madeline, but she was declared dead in 2002 which is around about i think it's um, six years after she died after she disappeared so one's got to ask at what point does the passage of time actually enter the equation and apparently with a hope narrative it never does because there's always hope rebellions are built on hope um and how are time scales related to other missing persons cases? So this is something I mentioned earlier, but to the casual observer and even the not so casual observer, the hope narrative is both compelling and convincing. There is even an official inquiry condemning adverse media coverage of the McCanns, notably the British media, um, as unethical and poor journalism. So in other words, if you don't, if you dare to run counter to the pro-McCann narrative, then that's unethical and it's poor journalism. Since the media have been accused of this before, it's easy to imagine they crossed this line with the McCanns, and clearly they did. The question is, how egregious was, was the inaccuracy? Was it completely baseless or was it somewhat baseless or something else? And, you know, the headlines like, syringe found in Madeline's apartment and body thrown into the sea both from the Daily Express and interestingly Amaral believes that Madeline's McCann was Madeline McCann's body was incinerated it's destroyed you'll never find it I'm not sure I agree with that what this comes down to ultimately is what is truth and what is the truth in this case in one sense there's the objective truth, which is, in a sense, unknowable. And then there's the legal truth, which is what society's official position is on truth. And, you know, I just watched A Few Good Men the other day, and there's that old thing about the code red and um, the lawyers knowing, all of the lawyers knowing what happened. But something like a code red isn't in any book, and it's not officially acknowledged that it happens you know, with military personnel, and yet it did happen, right? And so the guy, uh, Tom Cruise, playing the, the guy dealing with the cases, um, you know the law. It's not about um, what happened. It's, what about, it's, it's about what I can prove. And that is the issue with the McCann case. That's the issue with the Ramsey case. And what are the basic common issues with both cases, extremely contaminated crime scenes. Also, a huge PR narrative following all of this. Also, a long period before the police got to talk to the people at the center of it. In the Ramsey case, it was um, the 
um, John Bonet um, was murdered at Christmas and the parents were only sat down for official interview, a proper interview, um, about three, four months later, so around about the end of April. And with the McCanns it was quite similar. They sat down for an interview also around about four months later. So it was basically May, June, July, August. Same, exact same period as with the Ramses. And with the same result. So a useful way to illustrate how potentially irreconcilable objective and legal truth can be. Take religious belief. Is it objectively true? Some signs, if not most, will say no. Is it legally true? Well, it depends on which country you are. In Saudi Arabia, some beliefs are legally enforceable, but not necessarily legal, and certainly not elsewhere. The fact is the legal position of the McCann case is that Madeleine isn't dead, or rather there is no evidence to prove that she's dead. So that's the legal position. The legal position is that Madeleine isn't dead. But does that mean she's alive? I mean, are the Portuguese police looking for Madeleine? Or do the Portuguese police accept that she's not around? By the same token, are Madeleine's parents, do, do they sort of every now and then, once a year, go and look for her since she's out there? Do they... Um, have they got a, their own private investigator still? We'll leave the argument for the moment that there's no evidence proving she's alive either. In this respect, any publication claiming as fact or as potentially factual that Madeleine is dead runs foul of legal fact, but not necessarily of objective fact. Does that make sense? So from a legal perspective, certainly the media are constricted in making certain claims even if certain circumstantial and other evidence supports their claims. So, although DNA was found in the, the rental, it was inconclusive. So, it could have been Madeline's DNA, and if it was found to be Madeline's DNA, that would definitely prove to be problematic, because how the heck, after Madeline disappeared, could her DNA end up in the rental? But it was inconclusive. And uh, publishing Kate's diary, apparently without a permission, looks bad in the context of the way it's presented in that final episode. Um, on the other hand, Kate wrote a book in meticulous detail, which was serialized in the papers, and her diary formed part of that narrative. So the notion that Kate's interior world was violated feels a little less fraught than the way Kate frames it. I mean, it, it may not be, you know, maybe she did feel violated, but we're talking about the contents of a diary being published as a violation, and then one elects to do the same. Well, isn't one then violating oneself? If you look at some of the contents in Kate's book, it talks about her imagining Madeline's body, and I won't even go into it, but, um, you know, is it okay to say things like that about yourself, but it's not okay if somebody else says it. Because the diary was actually confiscated as evidence, and in many instances, diaries are used cynically by murder suspects to present a false narrative. Jody Arias famously lied to her diary, which was discussed and analyzed at length during her criminal trial. Amanda Knox kept a diary too, which she quoted at length, in her own self-justifying book. So you kind of have a situation where these people write diaries and then they, they quote from their own diaries to justify themselves. So is it really the end of the world if a, if a newspaper quotes from their diaries? And, and the, the diary thing, isn't a diary thing crying wolf in the same way that the Netflix documentary is crying wolf? In other words, isn't it something that the McCanns want, that the Netflix documentary came out? Wasn't it something that the McCanns wanted, that the diary was came out? I mean, why are you writing in a diary at that time if you didn't want it to be made public? And Jerry McCann wrote a public diary in terms of blogs in Jerry McCann's blog. 
and we're going to refer to that um, in the final episode in this trilogy dealing with the final episode um, just in what Jerry says in his very first post what he talks about in terms of the you know taking taking the kids to kids club taking them to the crash after Madeline's disappeared do people do that you know you've just lost your child your one child and then you take your other children somewhere leave them for the day but isn't this supposed to be a hotbed of pedophilia isn't it supposed to be um, overrun with abductors I mean the number of people they've identified as potential suspects is like a laundry list of of people it's like Pride Deluge is crawling with CD criminals but you want to take your your children and leave them in a crash and then and then literally go even to other countries go to they went to Italy they went to Spain they I think they went to Morocco Jerry went to America and he also went to back to Britain while his children were in Pride Deluge were they safe when he left I mean with all these CD characters wandering around being identified constantly so if News of the World committed dis a despicable act by stealing Kate's diary, w one could also argue that the same newspaper handed the McCanns a pricely sum, £125,000, which went into the Fine Madeline Fund, which is to say went by hook or by crook to the McCanns and the directors of the fund. The Sun serialized Kate's book, which was a major PR boost for the book, and and a deal probably worth millions so let's not forget it was the newspapers who also raised massive public awareness for the McCanns including publicizing the fundraising on their behalf with their own readers and making it known to the abductor that massive rewards were in the offing I mean it seems impossible to imagine that if Madeline was, abduc uh, was abducted the abductor was not aware of the enormous reward offered for a safe return well, apparently it wasn't enormous enough. 1.5 million pounds wasn't enough money for the abductor to say, okay, I'm going to leave her here by the sidewalk. Can you put some money into my Swiss bank account? Apparently it wasn't enough. But apparently he didn't ask for more either. What you won't find in the British press is what happened to the reward money since no one came forward to claim it. News of the World gave the McCanns 1.5 million uh, 1.5 million pounds reward money to to the find Madeline fund and I provided a link in the blog post where you can see what is being um, supposed there I don't think I can prove it that that news of the world gave him that money but apparently when Jerry McCann was asked about whether whether he or the fund had received the money he referred to the questioner to ask the publisher and suggested that the money wasn't actual money but pledges so you know I don't want to say they got the money and then I'm now a liar um, you've got to be careful in that respect so let's just say it looks like the newspaper gave still doesn't have the money put it that way and if they didn't have the money what happened to it so one version is that it was paid over regardless. Um, interestingly, in 2018, the McCanns tried to revive the Leveson inquiry, but this time the inquiry had other fish to fry. The, the Netflix documentary is silent on this recent failure, however. In other words, the, that the Leveson inquiry um, revival didn't happen. Clearly, the Leveson inquiry needs to be seen in proper context given the myriad ways the McCanns benefited from British media coverage and publicity and, m and some may be so bold to say profited um, from th their coverage. The point is from a distance a pair of well-to-do doctors appealing to the media for better treatment appears well-to-do in general and to the casual observer and the not so casual observer, the step, this step appears to confirm their overall credibility in terms of this case. But there's more. The McCanns took their cause even further and demanded British government intervention to investigate the disappearance of their daughter. 
Now, know what you're thinking. It stretches the credibility of a cover-up to breaking point, doesn't it? To have the suspects demand an investigation into their case. It may seem that way, and clearly the folks in this particular true, true crime case are smarter than the average, but the Ramseys made similar appeals to powerful political figures as well. Um, Ramsey himself ran for election twice. We must remember that, and just think about Chris Watts, when he gave the sermon on the porch, he was saying, you know, I really, it's great having the cops here. It's good that the dogs are going in the house and so on. So that is part of the ruse is where you're saying, well, uh, they're not going to find anything. So I'm, I, I welcome the cops. Um, you know, I'll help you with this. I'll help you with that. But you're not saying, you're not letting them on, on what you're not helping them with. For example, the, in, in Chris Watts' case, the affair. So it's also vastly underreported that Rams himself was affiliated with Lockheed Martin. Um, I'm not going to go too much into that any further. Um, with the McCanns, we see similar state level interventions. 2007 was the year Britain joined the European Union. And I think that's very un misunderstood. Um, in the same way with the Watts case that I think the oil industry and Anadarko and, and the plea deal, those actual mechanisms and dynamics, institutional dynamics are misunderstood. I think the same thing is very misunderstood in terms of what was going on in terms of the political process in Europe in 2007. What was happening? What was the setting up of the European Union? And where was this being, where, where was this negotiation happening? It was happening in Lisbon in October 2007. 2007 was the year Britain joined the European Union and they had some bargaining chips. They, they, they were things they wanted to negotiate. They, they were things, there were some quid pro quo. Obviously, now, none of that seems to matter, um, you know, in, in this time of coronavirus and Brexit. But in that time, it was the concern about joining the European Union. Are we going to get the best possible deal? And within that, this explosion of the McCann case, which became indeed a political football, and you could use it to get certain Anyway, let's, let's just go on uh, from there. If, if one considers a criminal case which has the potential to affect diplomatic relations between two countries, and make no mistake, they can. The Amanda Knox case did. Even Donald Trump weighed in on the Amanda Knox case. When that happens, then there are at least two possible scenarios. One scenario is that the suspects are guilty, and because there is no prosecution or perception of justice, this can lead to enmity not only towards the suspects but between the two nations um, but there's also the other possibility which is that they're innocent and the one government's intervening to protect them or I guess there's a third possibility which is they're not innocent but there's the appearance of innocence and the government is using this as a way to I don't know get what they want I don't know it's um, in the McCann's case, Portugal resented the way it was being depicted in the media and referred to the British media and the British police treating it like it might be a colonial power. And, you know, one of the main impressions that w were created of the McCann case, like the popular impression, is that the Portuguese police unfairly targeted the McCann's. Where do you think that impression came from? How do you think that impression came about? Well, if we look at the Netflix documentary, the entire Netflix documentary, a lot of the vibe of it, a lot of the uh, sentiment of it is saying, well, these, these Portuguese guys were, were pretty um, funny people. They, you know, they weren't very open-minded. Um, we had to tell them what to do. We had to ask them to look elsewhere. We had to ask them to investigate. We had to give them clues. They were fixated on just the McCann's, really. 
or was it the other way around that they did exactly what the McCanns wanted them to do until they couldn't um, hold off on the um, I don't want to say suspicions but on the on the suppositions so it almost looks like they were giving the McCanns the benefit of the doubt for as long as possible f from the Portuguese perspective By giving the public what they wanted, which is Madeleine to be alive and the McCanns to be innocent, one could theoretically diffuse a politically sensitive time bomb and the man the British government appointed to make sure the McCann case went where it needed to go was a man with the appropriately titled surname Gamble. So having come to the final episode gamble happens to be one of the primary nar narrators of the netflix series he's the man tasked by the british government with sorting out the mccann case and gamble has elected to sort out the case by publicly putting his weight behind it and interestingly gamble was also involved in the nora corrin case which wasn't about an abduction it was about a little girl getting lost that's the official version in that country where the foreign forces weren't able to run rough, roughshod over the Malaysians. And Gamble has um, been very public. He's very much in the media and in documentaries. Um, there's headlines like White Top Cop, White Top Maddy Cop is convinced McCann's are in the clear. Guess who that's a reference to? There's also who is Jim Gamble and what claims does he make in Netflix doc The Disappearance of Madeleine McCann? And that's from an article in Hot. You can read those articles uh, in the blog post. But it's all about Jim Gamble standing up for them. Another prominent narrator is Calvin McKenzie, uh, an editor of The Sun, who in episode 8 reveals that not for a single second did he believe the McCanns have ever had anything to do with Madeleine McCann's disappearance. Why not say that right in the beginning though? He has no doubt the McCanns are innocent. Well, why don't you say that in the beginning? And why is an editor of The Sun between 1981 and 1994, 13 years before the publicity of the case started, being asked to share his opinion on how the media treated them? Well, so much for political expedience and politically inexpedient court cases. Ten years later, Brexit is happening anyway. The best way to make a criminal trial go away is to make sure it never goes to trial. Sorry, to make a criminal case go away is to make sure it never goes to trial. But they didn't count on the lead detective writing a book or being sued or him countersuing and appealing. That has been a long process and hasn't helped the cause of the McCanns the Metropolitan Police, the British media or the British government, or even, I guess, the Portuguese government, who kind of wanna have, have wanted to keep things going, like keep the relationship between the countries going. So that is why you kind of had a slightly different, you almost had one political set of circumstances, I don't really say political, but you had one set of circumstances with the Portuguese cops and another set of circumstances with the Portuguese government. So in other words, the cops were finding something, but it wasn't something that was going to help British relations. And so th isn't that why Amaral hit the road? Because it was a narrative that wasn't really going to suit the overarching narrative, which was the hope of a European Union. In other words, Portugal and Britain and the rest of Europe wanted the McCanns not to be involved. They wanted the McCanns to be innocent. And a lot of the British folks felt that they were and felt that if you supported uh, the McCanns, you supported Britain. 
And you had a lot of the same kind of thing going on with Amanda Knox. If you supported um, Meredith Kircher, you were anti-American. Or if you supported Amanda Knox, you were anti-British in terms of that case. And then the Americans were explicitly anti-Italian. Um, and interestingly, the, the, the I don't know if the British really had a particular view on the efficacy of the Italians. But it, it's Im important to look at other cases like the Amanda Knox case to look at how political interference can change the outcome of a case. The best, uh, the, as, I, so as I say, the best way to make a criminal case go away is to make sure it never goes to trial. And it never really did. Um, they didn't count on the lead detective. Um, and look, there's another half hour of analysis to get through in the final episode of the series. But um, I think um, I think we're going to wrap up. Um, we're at 50 minutes in this episode. So the last thing to say is the idea of a rebellion built on hope is perfectly appropriate to the McCann case. At least in my view, the rebellion is arguably... A rebellion against fear, fear of death, which is in some ways admirable, positive and constructive. But one might also argue that this rebellion isn't just a touchy-feely belief, but that in spite of claims of no evidence that Madeleine is dead, actually it looks like there might be some evidence. If it's stronger than that, then the, re th then the rebellion isn't just against fear, it's potentially against common sense, against reality even perhaps against a legal system. We know the case is being debated and evaluated at the European Court of Human Rights. That court will decide whether the notion that Madeleine McCann is dead or alive either way is frivolous. It's interesting because now Britain as a member of the European Union has, a so has sort of fallen out of favor with the EU and not due to any fault of the EU. So what I'm saying is now the political situation is Britain's fallen out of the EU, so the EU don't really owe them anything. And so if there's any political relationship, or if there's any, um, uh, what's the word, if there's um, any radioactive uh, effect or afterlife or half-life of the McCann case, um, it's hard to imagine any kind of relationship needing to be protected with Europe now in the context of the end of the EU. What we can say is that plenty of pageantry surrounds the McCann case. It's not simply a case where we see investigations and police searches. We also see the couple meeting the Pope and releasing balloons and suing people, a lot of people. We see book deals, book launches, color-coded wristbands, hundreds of exclusive interviews, uh, invariably written by the same journalist, dozens of documentaries, innumerable anniversaries and celebrations, Madeline's birthday, commemorating her disappearance, and of course, the revolving door of PR personnel who plead the McCann's case to a salivating press, who in turn regurgitate these statements almost verbatim, that kind of pageantry. The pageantry isn't a foreign concept to Britain. Uh, the notion of royalty in the modern era and the royal family is fairly idiosyncratic to Britain and arguably the most British aspect of the nation. One could also say that the pageantry of the British royal family is more public and more publicized than royalty in any other country bar none. So let's not kid ourselves when we say pageantry can be very popular, powerful, political and a profitable tactic. But how much of this pageantry is really just a rebellion against a more pragmatic and realistic approach? Pageantry is bright, colorful, but above all, hopeful. Think about that. Pageantry is hopeful. It's about hope. Rebellions are built on hope. Rebellions are built on hope. So we're at uh, 53 minutes. I'm not going to take it further than this. One thing I want to recommend you do is go and have a look at the, scroll down to the bottom of the blog post, that's the links provided in the description here, and look at the image of Madeline holding the tennis balls. And just consider this possibility is, 
If you think about pageantry, the appearance of something that is not actually what it is, um, something that is fluffed up and something that is used to misrepresent something, think about that idea and then the idea of the entire Netflix series and also the, in, the idea of photos that are photoshopped and that are misrepresenting themselves as well. That what you are seeing isn't reality, it's pageantry. And the pageantry is hiding something else. The real question is, what is it hiding? Why is it hiding it? To what end? If you found this episode interesting, please subscribe to this channel. Like, please share with uh, those Facebook groups that are interested in the McCann case and other true crime communities. You can also read Deep Into Darkness, which presents some of the latest research into the McCann case that's available on Amazon Kindle. And then on the Patreon channel, um, you're going to have a look at the coverage there. On this channel and on Patreon, there'll be some uh, analysis of the journey that I took to Pride de Luge um, this time last year. I'll be showing you photos, calculations, theories, hypoth uh, hypotheses, and ultimately finalizing the review of the Netflix docu-series. So until then, until we get to part two in this analysis of episode eight in the Netflix series, which will be available very soon in the next day or so, I will see you guys next time.